Well, hello, everyone. I'm, as Valerie said, I am Coach Smedley. I am so excited to be here and share a positive message with you. Now, that may not sound like much, but coming from where I came from, being positive is huge. And you'll hear why as I tell you my story. My story begins in Cleveland, Ohio. I was born in Cleveland to teenage parents. My parents were 15 and 17 when they had me. And it only went downhill from there. When I turned 10, my dad caught a manslaughter case and went to prison. He did not walk out of prison until I was 25 years old. So keeping our relationship going for those 15 years was hard, but we did it. Family relationships can be messy. They can be difficult, but man, are they worth it. I love my dad so much. Even when everyone else was talking about him and mad at him and all of that, as his child who looks just like him, I never stopped loving my dad. And all of you that are parents, I want you to remember that. And believe me, it was ugly. Our situation, my dad's crime made the news. Everybody in our neighborhood, everyone at my school, everyone heard about it. And they, some of them already didn't like my dad, but I became his defender. My little 10 year old self felt like you're not gonna talk about my dad, but I share that. And other wisdom that I'll give you today, just to let you know, no matter where you start, if you make up your mind today that you're gonna make things better, and build a great life for yourself, that is possible. I wrote a book about my story of growing up in Cleveland and being poor and all the other issues I had. My book is called Embracing Your Story, How to Build a Great Life Out of Hardships. Embracing Your Story, How to Build a Great Life Out of Hardships. I used to be embarrassed by my story. My family was the house where the police were always there. Somebody was always fighting on the front yard. Can anybody relate? We were that family. And that didn't make us feel good. We weren't welcome a lot of places and people stared at us and pointed and talked about us. But I'll tell you all these years later, that helped us to support each other, to be strong, to grow our little family, knowing that we were different. Being different is not a good feeling. It really isn't. But as I tell you more about the story, I want you to know that you can come out of it and be successful. That's what my book was all about. How do you go through these things and then build a good life for yourself? And before we end, I will give you some pointers about how to do that. Because how many times you hear people tell you, well, why don't you just change and get your life together? And they don't give you any tips about how to do that. So I'm going to preach a little bit and just share my testimony a little bit. But I'm going to give you some actual tips. Let me give you my disclaimer. Coach Smedley is real. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I say what needs to be said. I'm not always politically correct. I'm not, you know, I step on toes a little bit. But it's coming from a good place. Because it's only when people are real with you and you're real with yourself, more importantly, when you're real with yourself, that you can make the changes you need to make. Let's start. So you know already that I was born in Cleveland. In addition to having teenage parents, I have other barriers. The first line in my book says, on the number line of life, I was born at minus 20. So think about a number line where you have zero and you have all the positive numbers on one side and all the negative numbers on the other side. Well, I was born at minus 20. I had 20 different barriers that I was literally born into. I had teenage parents. We were poor. I was on welfare my entire childhood. I have a learning disability that makes things a little more difficult for me to get. It takes me a little longer, but once I get it, I got it. But on and on, all of these different barriers. Um, both of my parents were sexually abused, both of them, mom and dad. And it just, you know, the list goes on and on. All of the different barriers and problems and issues. You know, you can feel sometimes like, what's wrong with me? 
why do I have a caseworker and a therapist and a counselor and, and all of these different people around you to help you because you're so messed up? Does anybody ever feel like that? I know I did. But as I kept going and learning, I wasn't messed up. My situation was messed up, but I wasn't. And that's a big part of what I want to instill today. You cannot look at yourself as broken and deficient and there's anything wrong with you. Nobody's perfect. We all have issues. But if you love yourself, and it helps when your grown-ups around you love you and help you love yourself. But even if you don't have that, at some point, you have to figure out how to love yourself. You can't find that from outside of you. And how many of us have got into situations because we were looking for love in all the wrong places, like that country song, <laughs> looking for love in all the wrong places. And so having these barriers, it made everything harder. School was hard. I hated school but I love learning. I had school years where I would miss 40 or 50 days of school. And back then, nobody even cared. No one came after me. There weren't any truant officers. I just wasn't there. But when I did show up, I did well. I passed the test. I had good grades. But nobody cared enough to find out why I was absent. And the reason, a lot of times I didn't have boots. I didn't have a coat to wear. And Cleveland, you know, we have bad winters there. So there were many times where I was just poor and, and going without the basic things that every kid needs. So I stayed home. But again, those, those years of poor attendance, nobody looking after me. When I was in school, I didn't connect with the other kids. I always felt different. And then after 10 years old, when my dad's crime was known, I really felt different. Let me tell you one story I had when I was in fourth grade. I had done a, some work for a reading group. I was leading my reading group. I was so happy. My mom used her food stamps to get me a treat so I could have treats for all of the kids. And I practiced in the mirror. And I got there that day, and it was open house. So I see all of these other parents are there with their children. Well, my parents never came. My dad was in prison and my mom was in a GED program. So I walk in the door and the teacher walks over to me. She said, oh, good, you're here. Can you give me your game to give to another student? Her parents are here today and we know your parents aren't coming. This is what my teacher said. All these years later, that still hurts. She said, give me your game because we know your parents aren't coming. And I did. What was I going to do? How can I argue with the teacher? So I handed over everything, the little treats, the worksheet, everything I had created and practiced so hard to make. Walking home that day, I realized school's not a good place for me. I hate it. And I just kind of kept going and limped through and finished school and graduated, but it was never the same because I realized that school was political. I was one of the poor kids and we were treated differently. That story stuck with me for years until in 10th grade, I found a teacher who saw that I could write. She noticed my poetry and she made me sign up for contests and she loved me in ways that I really needed. As the student who was invisible and nobody cared about, this lady took me under her wing. She had me sign up for contests and I won a few. She helped me realize that it wasn't school that I hated. It was the, the system, the politics, but I loved learning and I had some talent. I was creative, but it took all those years for someone to see it again. But I share that because how many of us have had those kind of experiences in the classroom where you're singled out or you're sent to the principal's office because you didn't fit in? Let's keep going. Another thing that happened a lot in my neighborhood was that the neighbors talked about us. You know, my mom had all these kids and, you know, we were a target for people to talk about and laugh at. I remember one time when our car broke down 
It broke down right in front of our house. We made it home. It had been sputtering and threatening to shut off, but we made it right to the front of our yard and it went out and it started getting cold and it started snowing. And it, I mean, this situation is getting worse. My mom is pregnant. I am probably 10 or 11 by then. My sister is six or seven and we're out here trying to push this car. I looked across the street and my neighbors had the curtains open and they were looking at us and then they started laughing. Nobody came out to help. I looked at a couple of houses. People were just looking out of the window, cracking up at how we're struggling. So we started crying and we're just pushing and struggling. And eventually it took a lot of time. I can still feel how cold my little fingers were, but eventually we pushed the car into the yard with my little sister steering the car. It's bigger than her in the front seat. She's steering the car. So we get in the driveway, but I'll tell you the good news from that story. I realized for the first time that sometimes you have to push the car. Nobody's coming to help. You don't have AAA, no tow truck, nobody. It's all on you. You have got to get some things done. So when you have the family that struggles and has so many barriers, you can't give up. The main thing you have to do is keep trying. And I remember one time when my mom was trying. Now, by then she was 19. She had a couple more kids, but she wanted to get into a nursing program. She went into this program. She had seen all these commercials and you can get into nursing and have a good career. So she went and filled out the paperwork. And once she was done, she took the clipboard up to the front desk and there was a lady behind the desk and she scanned over everything. You know how your welfare redetermination appointments are and all those government assistance programs, what you go through. She's scanning through the papers and she said, oh, I'm sorry, you're not eligible. This program is for people with one illegitimate child and you have more than that. Everybody in the lobby is looking at my mom and she was a nervous smoker. My mom smoked two to three packs of cigarettes a day because of the stress. Because she had nobody to talk to. She went outside, lit up a cigarette, and looked across the street. They were finishing a community college. Cuyahoga Community College is one of the first community colleges in the country. And she said, maybe they'll take me. She went across the street, met the nicest people, they got her registered for college. Now, grant you, grant you, nobody in our family had ever gone to college, so we didn't know how it worked. But she walked across the street, went inside, and walked out of there enrolled in college. And she didn't look back. She got one degree and a second degree and a third degree. You know, she used that. Now, this is a time when my dad was in prison. But while he was locked up, my dad got his high school diploma. And he earned his college degree. So what I'm saying is, no matter where you are, take what you have, gather up all your broken pieces, and start stitching something together. Just don't stop. That lady could have discouraged my mother when she said that. She was so nasty. How many of you have gone through that, where somebody just says things to you and just cuts you down in front of other people? But you can't let that stop. And, the, and I'm mentioning a lot of these things from the past because our past is always sitting there with us, especially when you have a lot of time to think about it. I'm going to suggest that you come to terms with your past, embrace it, like my book, embrace your story. Don't run from it. Don't be ashamed of it. How can this be useful? Everything I suffered through has had the effect of helping me to be more kind to others. Some people are very quick to say, why doesn't he just stop drinking? Or why doesn't she just stop doing whatever? I know these people haven't been through much. Anybody that has an easy answer, I know they haven't been through much because they have a quick solution. Why don't she just, and it's real judgmental. I'm a, I'm a little more calm and patient when I see somebody struggling because I know what the struggle is like. 
you may not have had the exact same pain that I had, but you may know pain. And that's what I want. That's what connects us. That's why I'm here talking to you today. You all are all over the country. I may never meet you in person, but I want you to hear from Coach Smedley to you. Wherever you start, just start. Don't let the past, your haters, any of that, don't let them win. Don't let them beat you down. Keep trying. Realizing that I have a learning disability and I didn't come from the best family and and I don't have access to a lot of professionals growing up, I understood that things would take me longer. And that's okay because I still get there. Some of us didn't have the best beginnings. But I'm going to leave you with three questions to ask yourself that you can use to make everything better. Number one, how did I get here? That's right. How did you get in your current situation? And you need to be honest. I mean, three o'clock in the morning when you're alone with your thoughts, honest. I don't mean what you say around other people or how you respond when they criticize you. I mean, when it's just you and you. How did I get here? What led to your arrest, your incarceration? If this is not your first time, what led to it this time and all of the other times before? You've got to understand that and be honest with yourself. Something got us here. Now, I'm going to say this. Many of us that have struggled and made mistakes and have failed, we had a lot of help. We had people that didn't treat us like they should have that didn't take care of us like they should have. Actually, from zero to 18, your parents are supposed to take care of you and do that to the best of their ability. And sometimes we have parents that fall short. But from 18 on, that's on you. I could look at my teen parents who didn't know a lot and who struggled with their own issues, each of them. I can't dwell on that. I have to think about how it affected me, but then I have to figure out where do I go from here now that I'm a grown man. So asking yourself, how did I get here? You need to analyze who are the people, places, and things that got you where you are today. And you're going to have to make some hard choices. You may have to cut some of them loose. And I mean that. I don't care if it's your mama, your cousin, your favorite third cousin. If they are not a good influence, you may have to cut them loose. And that's not easy, but it's necessary. I actually moved from Cleveland. I had to move from Cleveland and I moved 300 miles away because I didn't like the path that my relatives were taking and they were going to drag me down with them. When I had a child, I made a bold decision. I've got to get out of here. No one is successful around me. Everybody's struggling. I have got to get out of here to give us a chance to do better. So understanding who is in your inner circle, everybody around you is not pulling for you. Everyone that whispers in your ear is not a supporter. It's not a fan. When people say stuff like, well, why would you take that job? Eh, I don't know. I don't think you can do that. Well, they just shot your confidence down. Why are they saying that? What's their motive? They don't want you to get a great job and rise up above them and leave them. Not everyone that talks to you is for you. You've got to figure it out. Who is really a supporter? When you got arrested, do you always get in trouble when you're with that same relative or friend? Look for the patterns. That's what I'm saying. Look for the patterns. What things keep repeating themselves and keep landing you in trouble. And that might be people, places, or things like the program teaches. Okay, so that's the first thing. How did I get here? The second thing I wanna suggest is this question. How am I investing my time? Time is the great equalizer. I don't care how rich you are, you don't have any more time than the next person. There are 168 hours in a week. That's a lot of time. What are you doing with your time? If you're playing spades, great. 
But do you really need to play 18 hours a week on, of spades? What else could you do with 18 hours? You could learn a language. You could learn, get better at computers, pick up some skills or knowledge. I'm not saying don't play spades. I know y'all gonna play your cards. It's okay, I get it. But what else can you do with 168 hours a week? And I know when you're depressed, when you're isolated, when you're frustrated, it's easy to fall into a rut. Pick yourself up and say, what can I do with my time and make it a good investment? Even once you're released, what are you doing with your time? Because one thing that we all know, everything is going to speed up once you get back out. Now you have to worry about bills and housing and food and clothing and the people that are coming at you. Everybody's tugging at you. Once you're outside, time will speed up. Use this time now to build, to grow, to learn. Use your time wisely. And my third question, how can I strengthen my weaknesses? This may be the most important of the three. How can I strengthen my weaknesses? Many of us are embarrassed by our weaknesses. If you can't read that well, or whatever your weakness might be, I don't want to call out any, you know what your weaknesses are. But acknowledge that it's a weakness. And then what? What steps can you take to help strengthen that and make yourself better? Many of us spend a lot of time being embarrassed and being ashamed. And I learned that that just wastes time. If I took that same time to help grow my weaknesses, and I love basketball. So let me break in and use a basketball example. As a Clevelander, of course, I'm a Cavs fan, okay? But back in the day, there was a player named Mark Price. Mark Price was amazing because he was consistently a free throw shooter, highest in the league. He ended his career with a 90% three throw, free throw percentage. That's for his whole career. Who does that? 90% from the free throw line? Come on. But then I looked into his story because I had to find out how is this guy doing this? His dad would make him and his little brother go outside and practice free throws and they try to get to 100 and they do this pretty much every night from the time they were little kids so fast forward to his nba career of course he's going to have an advantage because he's been doing this since he was a little kid what's my point if you practice and perfect your skill you will be a high achiever and sometimes practicing it may take years. But whatever your weakness is, identify it and figure out how can I go beyond that weakness. Your weakness is just something to inspire you to strengthen. It doesn't handicap you. It doesn't mean that you'll never achieve. Use it to motivate you, to push you. So let me recap those three questions to ask yourself. How did I get here? How am I investing my time and how can I strengthen my weaknesses? This is Coach Smedley and I just wanted to share a few of the things that have helped me in my life. Be well, stay focused and start where you are right now today.